First they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. Health and biotech news. A tech bro or sis would find kind of interesting. We are here to celebrate the completion of the first survey. On the advice of counsel, I will not be giving an opening statement. Of the entire human genome. So let's start with the Babylon Health story. So Babylon Health is this amazing British healthcare unicorn company. And I want to just talk about Ali Parsa because his background is really, really interesting. So he is the ultimate American dream immigrant story. He comes to the UK as a refugee from Iran, comes by himself as a teenager, learns English, goes to UCL, does a PhD there, and then eventually becomes an investment banker at Goldman Sachs and launches Circle Health, which was a private healthcare provider. He grows that to $200 million in revenue, leaves a little bit unceremoniously, and then launches Babylon Health. And his vision for Babylon Health was that he's going to do with healthcare what Google did with information. So make it freely available to the whole world or cheaply available, easily accessible. And he made what is essentially a telehealth platform with some AI components. And he raised over a billion dollars for this vision. Babylon at its peak was valued at over $4 billion. And then it all went a bit wrong, essentially. After it was floated by a SPAC in New York for $3.4 billion, he described that whole ordeal as an unbelievable, unmitigated disaster. And in the last 18 months, Babylon's share price has dropped by 99%. And we're now at a stage where they're about to wipe all of their investors following a restructuring deal. And it looks like Albacore, its main investor, are poised to take over control. So what exactly has happened here? And do you guys have any thoughts on what was wrong with the vision or why Babylon Health didn't work? Because it sounds like a great idea. So Babylon started about 10 years ago, right? If you think about what building AI and healthcare looked like then, of this kind of AI, which is like conversational AI, text-based AI, for anyone who's not aware, initially it was a chatbot where uh, you basically, in a converse, conversational way, you kind of gave a history, you sort of described your symptoms and it would steer you one way or the other, and then eventually plug you into a doctor. In those days, that required really like an army of technical people, uh, product managers, AI product managers, clinicians, engineers, data scientists, data engineers, uh, quality assurance people, like huge, huge armies of people. And I think Babylon will have had like thousands of people at peak, I would guess, or well over a thousand. So the company in the first instance picked a huge problem in terms of the complexity. If you think about primary care, a lot of what primary care physicians are doing is they're triaging the stuff that comes to, through the door. But in primary care, anything can come through the door. You can get somebody who's pregnant with a complication of pregnancy. You can get somebody who's having a really like self-limiting illness that will get better on its own. You can have someone with sepsis. You have a young person. You can have an old person. You know, someone with complex cancer who has some sleeping problems and lots of medications you have to tweak. So it's horrendously complicated. And the problem which they applied their artificial intelligence to was the triage of that patient population in primary care. Now, we've talked a lot on this podcast about the use of AI in healthcare. Many of the most compelling cases are like quite well-defined problems with quite specific types of data inputs where uh, machines are learning patterns on those specific inputs. So you might have images of the back of the eye or images of the external eye. Um, you might have like chest x-rays. You might have ECGs. This is a very different problem. This is like you know, much broader in, in its scope. So they picked a really hard problem with a very, very challenging um, technical uh, dimension to it and also a regulated problem. You know, if you really want to do this properly and do proper triage and save money in the healthcare system, again, we've talked about this in the past, um, you're basically like using your software, your, your tool as a medical device. So there's a regulatory barrier and a safety barrier that you have to clear. So I, my first point is that I think Babylon picked a very difficult and challenging problem to solve out of the gates. I don't know what your guys' thoughts are on that. So one of their big products was uh, GP at Hand, which is like an online GP uh, th that delivers NHS services. Um, and they were actually quite big. They, uh, it was a huge deal with the NHS. What, what it was supposed to do was deliver the same services as a GP at lower cost using digital, using technology. But what happened was that patients were using their services more than they, you would use a normal GP. So it didn't actually save, uh, I believe it didn't actually save that much uh, money. Uh, because but it was more expensive, just, wasn't it? Because the young it was more expensive, people yeah. were using it more. Yeah. But that's kind of a comment on uh, on the current state of GP uh, in, in the UK. 
so that means that people aren't using like aren't happy with their with the GP service and you can ask anyone on the street they would say that and if they do get you know better healthcare um they will use it more yeah so so there's a there's a there's a phenomenon in primary care which is not restricted to babylon which is supply driven demand which is when you create supply when you create appointments the appointments get basically booked the demand appears to take the appointments it's a bit like for example when you build a bigger motorway more people start buying cars and start driving and commuting by road. So these dynamics exist in this system. So Babylon's uh, artificially inflated supply, I think, was basically externally funded by investors where you could book a doctor and you would get one much quicker than you would on the NHS. And so you had, a, as you're saying, you had younger patients registering for that service and using it more uh, than they would normally. So they're kind of driving more demand as a consequence of the supply. So the business model is like a bit inherently disadvantaged as a result. Well, from really first principles thinking... The, I think the core assumption, Amran, I mean, you started a effectively a telemedicine startup and grew that. I mean, is this core assumption that taking a doctor's visit or a doctor's consult and just putting it online, making it digital, there's a there's a belief that I think we all have as tech pe- tech uh, inspired people or whatever that that will somehow make things better or that will save yeah. money or that will make things more efficient. When actually you still need that one on one time with the doctor ultimately. So really you're not making you're not moving the needle very much. Is that sort of correct? Yeah, yeah and so the short answer is yes. You still need like an X number of minutes of a physician per patient, right? So one of the like north star metrics in the efficiency of a service like this is patients per FTE physician. So let's say you have one GP. I think the benchmarks from my memory are about thirteen to fourteen hundred patients per FTE. That means an average GP practice of ten thousand patients in the UK will have about six full-time GPs, if I remember correctly. You'll see that there are more efficient practices or practices that use allied healthcare professionals more, um, who can take on a bigger patient population with those same six doctors. If you're creating a service like this, then fundamentally you're not changing the unit economics of that care delivery. What you are changing is you're making the experience a bit simpler. For the patient, Uh, you you don't have to take time off work. Um, You don't have the same childcare issues. You're also flexing on the operating model on the doctor's side because you don't have, you know, need all your GPs sitting in one building, but you can actually distribute them in different geographical areas. So it solves certain problems, and there will be marginal efficiencies at the at the kind of edges of that. But the fundamental problem is how many FTEs, how many patients per FTE can you register in your practice? And also, it it doesn't really address the whole problem with primary care, which is kind of the incentive of the deliverer of the of of healthcare is different than the patient's incentive. So, what I mean by that is the healthcare provider uh, is incentivized to see more patients, while the the patient wants to wants to improve their health. So, the majority of doctors and healthcare services are paid by volume, uh, whereas I don't care if, if if my GP can see more more patients. I want them to improve my health outcomes. So there's like a kind of a fundamental misalignment between the two. But in the UK, I think that's less of an issue because the the way that the UK healthcare system works is a bit in primary care is a bit more like an insurance model, where each patient carries a um, money with them. So the patient brings budget to the clinic they're registered with, and then yeah, the so clinic acts as a cost volume. center. They're paid by volume of registrants. They're not paid by yeah. volume of care delivered. Right, so the two, so the ideal scenario is high registered patient volume delivered at lowest possible cost creates the greatest possible margin for from a financial point of view. Obviously, there are other incentives around quality of care um, that they have to hit as well. But that that is the fundamental problem, as you said. Like younger people probably carrying a bit less capitation fee with them because they don't have the multi morbidity, and then using the service more than you would expect because it's available. And so, so then they're eating into that- the margin. That primary care providers are incentivized to make to use less tech to not enable people to be uh, to access healthcare easily. It depends what you mean by access. So if the access is costing them, in, like mar- if the marginal cost of an increased interaction with a patient is high, i.e., it's a doctor on a phone on a video spending time, then that's actually economically not good for the clinic. In a capitation-based model, yes, that's true. But if you can create a system which is the Babylon dream and a dream of a lot of AI-enabled um, healthcare delivery companies, which is that you can service the patient's needs without human intervention, without human time. Maybe, for example, you're triaging the cases that need a human to look at them, uh, or you're serving up like a recommendation that a human just clicks approve and then the care pathway is delivered digitally. So those types of things don't cost much per, like there's no, the marginal cost on the clinician's time is very low. So that's the kind of economic goal 
um, and it, this might all seem a bit technical, but essentially what, what you want is like software that actually starts doing the work of a clinician safely and can take that risk away from the clinician and the time and can absorb that cost to free up the clinician's time you know, to do more. So is a lesson here for other digital health startups as well? Because Adam kind of touched on this point, which is the point of friction, just putting friction in place to make things difficult. So make it difficult to get a primary care appointment or a specialist opinion or get a scan done. And we have this belief that wouldn't it be amazing if everyone had access on their smartphone across the world to instant healthcare? That was kind of the Babylon dream as well. But yeah. really in Imran, what you've talked about in this you know, supply induced demand problem where the more supply you increase, uh, the more access you give, people just end up using that service more and more and more and more. And there's no savings to be made. So is a lesson here that reducing friction is not always a good thing. And sometimes that friction is actually enabling the whole thing to work. Well, in the in the in the old paradigm of primary care, some people may not like me saying this. Yeah, in a capitation model like we have in the UK, in the UK, there is an element of don't make it too easy to get an appointment. There is an element of that, and it's a very fine balance that's being walked, which is between getting the right outcomes and not having a safety issue with your availability of appointments, but also not overserving the population where you don't get incremental satisfaction i mean just to make it easier on. to understand so musty you've you've probably worked in a &E, i've worked in a &E. 50 percent of the people that you see in a &E are probably people who shouldn't be there right um they come in with complaints that um are not either emergencies or uh, you don't need any medical intervention so Musty just got fired <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm an active but, clinician adam i can't agree or disagree <laughs> <laughs> just in general like um some might say a, a hypothetical you know, some yeah, might say a, yeah a friend said <laughs> but if you make it arguably if you make it difficult if the appointment times are weeks uh someone who has a mild headache is just going to forego the opportunity to see a doctor so that's kind of uh the issue we're talking about yeah and the other aspect of this i think is like the what i would call the first mover disadvantage that babylon had so because they kind of entered with like in the AI paradigm 1.0, their, their fundraising requirements and the product development efforts required to build a kind of AI type thing that, you know, is, you know, like has been published is actually like reasonable, but not that good and not that safe. Those were astronomically high and they couldn't bridge that chasm between creating the availability and that great service and delivering it in a more cost effective technology driven way. It was still fundamentally like people needing to deliver the service. So the kind, of the, my understanding, and this is all just outside in. Like they basically tried to, you know, with those constraints, with all those people, with that technology, is like where's the business model for this product? And they tried everything. They tried UK, US, Rwanda, Canada, Asia. They tried health insurance. They tried primary care, public, primary care, private. They made deals with secondary care hospitals as a digital front door. They went to the US and they did value-based healthcare. So if you create like a grid, you've already- They also got launched like, like Babylon 360, which is basically what I'm doing, it, yeah. like a longevity service. <laughs> yeah. And then, so you basically, you've got, essentially you've got like uh, more than a dozen business models. And I think that's a sign that the company was constantly chasing and pursuing and trying to find that where are we going to make the unit economics of this business work? Yes. In the meantime, everybody knows that healthcare is the biggest industry in the world. It's 20% of US GDP. I think the U.S. tech industry is like a trillion or something. I don't know, maybe um, or, or more, depending on how you define it. Healthcare is like four trillion. It's bigger than basically bigger than the verticals that tech companies are playing in. So that's the prize, and the dream was always sold, as you say. And I think what's now happened is that you have a second generation of companies, or maybe third generation, however you define it, coming through with large language models. Uh, we talked about one being funded today, fifty million dollars from A16Z and General Catalyst, which is building a healthcare-specific large language model. Um, which is basically clinical reasoning as a service, which is what Babylon has spent basically a decade trying to build. I guarantee you that this company that raised 50 million probably has like maybe two dozen staff max and it's built something really good. So that's the productivity dividend do you think, of technological do you think they, progress. Do you think their value was, like they raised too much money, their value was inflated too much too, too early, which makes them pursue have to pursue these larger and larger markets go, yeah, to justify totally. their go, early valuation? Go big or go home. The truth is they couldn't they couldn't get um, to the scale they need to return 10x, 20x, 100x on their valuation in the UK market. So they had to go to the US and you can become a victim of the money that you raise. Absolutely. You see it all the time. This is an extreme example because it's so value destructive um, and that is, that's why people are talking about it. But there are lots of examples of that. 
And do do you think um, them going public via SPAC has a role to play here? Because it seems like uh, most of the companies going through who went public through SPACs, uh, yeah. it's it's being a trend. Now. The, it's a bit of yeah. a trend now that these companies are all. Um, being devalued at the moment. Yeah, Imran, can you give yeah. 10 seconds on what a SPAC is as well? Why yeah. that's significant? So, yeah, so somebody creates a company, it's a shell company, and they give it an objective like healthcare, um, food, automation, whatever. They then raise money uh, from any investors out there in the market. They could be institutional investors or private people. That's when the SPAC IPOs, right? So it goes public. Then it's traded on the stock market, but it doesn't have a company in it. And at some point, they're searching for a target. So they find the target and then they uh, merge with the target or they de-SPAC, which is the special, I think SPAC stands for, I can't remember what it stands, like special purpose acquisition company or something. They basically merge with the target. So then the target becomes publicly listed by virtue of a merger with this vehicle, the SPAC vehicle. Um, if that doesn't happen, that shell company folds and gives the money back to investors. What happened to Babylon is that just before the SPAC merger was kind of consummated, a bunch of investors that had committed to it withdrew their funds. So Babylon's SPAC was actually, I think, half the size of what it should have been, and they sort of progressed with it with that hiccup. The other kind of macro thing that's happening here is that we've gone from like a zero interest rate environment to a high interest rate environment. When you're in a high interest rate environment, capital that you raise uh, becomes expensive. And the future value of your business gets discounted. It gets like people become much more near term in their horizon. They stop looking out five, 10, 20 years because what happens out there, uh, basically the value of that is kind of modeled to zero. So Babylon in the last 18 months or two years, whenever it was, um, was not profitable, but you know, wanted to become profitable in the future, but then the, the market, the macroeconomic climate has totally changed and people have, have basically sort of turned their backs on these types of unprofitable companies projecting profitability far out into the future. So the company basically got hammered. And then also their losses are widening. So they're losing money on every unit of 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 like business. And then those losses are increasing. So I think they lost something like uh, 60 million in the last quarter. The company has about 70 million, 75 million in cash. I think 50 million of that is earmarked for the private takeover will go to their creditors. The company that's going to take them over, as I understand it, lent them some money. And they have like 25 million additional and then their total market cap is like 27 million. So that money plus the company is like worth like 27 million plus all the other liabilities and so on. Can I, can I get your guys' take on my yeah. really simple um, understanding of what went wrong with Babylon's business model? This is what I've been able to muster together, which is essentially that Babylon is like a pig with lipstick on. So it's this company that's essentially almost a health insurance company and a really traditional business model that's then been slapped with this label of like technology and AI. Because fundamentally, you take what, so whoever your payer is, whether that's a national health service in the UK, whether that's an insurer in the US, you say, hey, give me $100 for this patient and I'll look after them for this year. And then you have some actuaries, some smart people who predict that, okay, it's actually only going to cost us $93 based on what we're doing to look after this patient. So, okay, here's the margin, here's $7. And this has been going on for ages. This was nothing new. And Babylon's promise was that they were going to use all of this AI triage and all of this new technology, all of this telemedicine to ultimately save costs and bring that cost down and down to the point where maybe they're only spending $60 per patient and they're getting paid $100. And that's where they were going to become profitable. Was it essentially that this is a, it was a very traditional old school business model that didn't have much margin in it because we know that there's not loads of margin in that, especially compared to SaaS or tech? And it was being dressed up as this huge AI company when that AI actually didn't really exist or it was in development. Or a lot of insiders are saying, this. look, this was all vaporware. When Ali Parsa was giving these demos, this stuff didn't really exist or it was kind of in, in the process of being built and it's all just come to a head. Is that a reasonable take on this? I mean, it's, it's difficult to say, to be honest, um, you, you know, how much of this was, as you said, dressed up like a traditional business. But, you know, we do know that they took on a huge problem it is a really complex uh, industry, a super complex problem to solve, and they tried. Uh, I think what like we kind of uh, should talk about more is like lessons learned and what people like uh, listening to the podcast could take away from this. I think as uh, Imran said, uh, like pursuing an early valuation with like promises into the future is probably not a good strategy in this market. Like you need to think a bit smaller and think a bit narrower and think a bit leaner. Uh, so that's kind of the major takeaway when it comes to 
um, like this valuation issue. Yeah. And, and I think, first, so first of all, it's like, yeah, just to build on what Adam said there, I think that's right. Like, on your point about pig with lipstick, so a lot of businesses are like that. Look at Uber. Mm. Uber is like a taxi company, but, <laughs> um, you know, but it has this like second horizon, third horizon. So it's like then a logistics company and then it's like a data company, an autonomous driving company and so on. So these animals are metamorphosizing into, you know, uh, unicorns or uh, phoenixes, as I've heard them described it in some, or, as you know, it's just basically they're, they're going through these stages of maturation where there's um, something that's very messy and boring or like difficult to build in the first instance, but that actually puts you in a position either through lockout because you've got great commercial contracts that give you a defensible position or you've got loads of data or you built the healthcare workforce, you gathered the greatest data set, it kind of opens up this next horizon. I myself am a believer, this might shock you, in like the, Bar the Babylon paradigm. I don't have a problem with the, sh the kind of overarching arc of that storyline. I think it's very compelling. And I think one day a company or hopefully multiple companies because it's healthcare and it's not a monopoly will like capture that type of capability and deliver that type of thing of you know, zero marginal cost healthcare that becomes free for all accessible on your phone, is through multiple channels, et cetera. I believe in that and I hope that that is achieved one day. And I respect, really, I respect any entrepreneur that sincerely believes and like commits their life to trying to do that fully. On an execution level, yeah, I mean, if you're raising tons and tons of money and your unit economics aren't, your technology is not able to kind of catalyze that improvement in your unit economics, then you're basically growing your bonfire, you know, <laughs> quarter by quarter and you're throwing more and more stuff onto it. Eventually, you're going to run out of resources, right? So um, it's, for me, it's not the story. It's more like, I'm sure there'll be lessons learned in the execution. I wasn't on the inside. I can't say I don't know the value of their deals. Um, I don't know, like maybe they got to a point where they had to try and just go go big or go home. Otherwise, they would have been wiped out in another way. Um, so it's very, very difficult to say. How much uh, of the job of a founder is to just create hype, be liberal with the truth, promise things today that are actually coming tomorrow, that sort of thing. I mean, we've seen high profile examples of like Adam Newman and Elizabeth Holmes, of course. And from what I've heard, the kind of insiders in Babylon were saying that they were, that what was being projected outside didn't necessarily exist today. They were kind of promising things that were going to come later on. And all of this fancy AI technology wasn't actually working. Their chatbot AI wasn't actually very good, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's this guy called uh, Dr. Murphy22, I think on Twitter, who's a oncology consultant in London. He's very, very critical of Ali Parsa and Babylon. And I mean, he just tweets all the time calling him a like a charlatan. He's saying that he's been misrepresenting what's coming out. So when- so fraud, Just I in think, general, I mean, like- uh, I it's easy to be to criticize and it's easy to be negative about these people so i don't really like that line but um i think you need to you need to sell but you also need to build so like uh you, you can't just focus all your time on selling and and building hype if if you're not actually building there needs to be a fine balance between the two the two especially in healthcare it's a yeah. bit uh, tricky when it comes to healthcare i think you, there needs to be um nuance that there needs to be that you, you can't go too much on the selling uh side yeah but i mean it's it's a really tough question honestly i think it's really really hard like if you look at elon musk and you say like um you know if elon stood up on stage and was like hey guys like we might get to mars like i would say like the risk adjusted probability is like you know quite low and I would quite like to get there. I think you know, something bad could happen. Like He doesn't say that. He's like, yeah, we're building, going to Mars, and we need these like rockets, and then we're going to build this rocket, then that rocket, and that rocket will get us there, et cetera. And so he has that vision. Um, well, he also demonstrates like, improvement over time. So he does demonstrate that building capability. Yeah, and Babylon did that as well, right? Like their early chatbot, and then they had that demonstration where they were like reading the emotion on the person's face, and then they were like promising to integrate wearables, and they were giving real-time recommendations to the physician when the conversation is happening. And you know, they were showing like some improvements. So I think it's like, I think that there's a gray area and I personally don't like to be like knee deep in the gray area. And I, you know, people will have different appetite for like how they set out their vision as, you know, with the, how concrete they make it as to what's available today and where the future is going. Building a company is about attracting two types of resources, right? It's all about attracting money, financial capital, 
and attracting human resources, the people that will build and have the ingenuity, creativity to kind of see it to the end. And the start, startups are inherently risky. You have to attract people with the boldness and the um, inspirationalness of your vision, right? So you need to do that in order to convince people to leave their stable jobs at Google or at NHS or what have you to jump aboard your ship. So I think that this salesmanship and marketing, in the case of this company, I will leave it to other commentators to decide whether it went too far or not because I don't have inside information. I haven't studied it that closely. But I do think healthcare is a bit of a special case. And I think as investors, you should always apply a lot of scrutiny. And if you don't have healthcare experts who are helping you to assess investment opportunities, you need to bring them in to understand regulatory, clinical safety, uh, like pathways, uh, levels of evidence, statistical significance, true and false positives, and like all of this type of stuff. Yeah. Uh, guys, I uh, still have an issue with my charger, actually. I replaced it. So uh, I'm at like 5% now. Okay. Um, let's um, let's wrap up then. Okay. Am I, or am I anything else? Or do you, no, no, you want to no. do a bit more? Or are you... Why don't we, should we do a quick one on like, so I can ask a question. What, what, what will the next Babylon look like? Like the one that actually like maybe works? Like what will that need to look like? What characteristics will it have? How do you think it will emerge? That's a really good question. Um, I've got nothing to add here. I think there's there's a really good uh, article by A16Z that talk about the big opportunity in healthcare, and it's a uh, it's basically they envision a company that merges properly uh, delivery of healthcare and the insurance side. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big delta between the two, and there's a, a lot of uh, work to do to improve efficiency. So. It, it will look something like that, like a, an insurance company that actually delivers the care. Well, what's your take on it, Imran? What do you think? On the first question, I think that there will be like, I think there'll be a stepwise transition. I think there'll be companies that look a bit like Babylon that emerge, that give you basically infinite access to a physician, mm -hmm. but it's not a real physician. Um, mm -hmm. A bit like we're seeing at the moment, um, that happening with counseling, there are CBT apps that have increasingly like uh, automate or, you know, using basically algorithms to generate their responses to patients. So I think that the, the level of maturity of those systems will go up to a point where you can speak to a physician. I don't know if it will be a generalist physician first, or it will be like in a specialist area, like a physician who can interpret blood test results, as an example, virtual, or a physician who can answer your questions on contraception or something very like specific. So I think we'll see lots of companies that are a little bit like that, that pop up. A bit like Dr. Gupta. <laughs> I don't know how good that is, but that sort of user experience, I think, will, will emerge. And then I think there'll be a, like another horizon, which is basically something which is doing predictive analytics on your healthcare and can give you recommendations, but is using types of data that are not used today that will increasingly become commonplace. So things like wearable data, may, maybe like um, data on your like emotional uh, well-being or what have you from your interactions with your computer, your smartphone, your typing, things like that. So I think you'll increasingly see like the integration of uh, sensor data and uh, multimodal data into these algorithms. And there's quite an interesting vision for like how AI should be shaping our lives in the future, which is this company called Humane. Did you see this? No. Um, it's an ex-Apple designer. They've been under stealth for a very long time. They raised a lot of money. They basically like uh, demoed this product, I think, at a TED conference where it's just this little thing that sits in your pocket. It doesn't have a screen, but it's like interacting with you in real time. It can project messages onto your hand. It can talk to you. So I think that these things, I personally hope that they begin to recede from our attention and they start to like, you know, become more things that are in the background that are just nudging us in the right direction. Uh, but I think yeah. in the near term, it will be like chat interfaces. It may even still feel like a video call. I mean, you could stitch GPT-4 together with a a text to voice generator like 11x or synthesia i think or some of these companies that create video and you can create a video call with a doctor that's not real and it will be quite good look can i i also just want to put my chips on the table with the, what the next big healthcare company is going to be Go i'm going to i have no knowledge um i have no insight but i'm going to just say it's going to be something to do with robotics and providing elderly care at home i think that's a huge problem population pyramid big trend and that's my prediction for what the next babylon health is going to be robotics in providing care for elderly people Absolutely. All right. So I'm going to hang up because the uploading is... Uh, yes. It's so like uh, not to disrupt the uploading. All right, Adam. See you later. Uh, All right. This was bye good. Yeah. We'll do another one next week. Take care, guys. Right, bye, guys. See you bye, later. Bye-bye.